So I've entitled it Abide in Me. But of course you can't abide in Him until you've connected to the vine. That, that's first. You, you have to uh, get connected, which we think of as conversion, and then you can abide. So verse 1 says, with Jesus speaking, I am the true vine. Now that indicates that there's more than one vine. But he is the true vine. Satan has a vine as well. And his vine seems to grow better just like the weeds grow better in our garden than the, the plants do. So we have to be careful that we don't get connected to the wrong vine. But he said, I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. So the, uh, the father is the one that takes care, apparently, of this vineyard and of this vine and all who are connected with it. In the Tsar of Ages, page 676, it says, As the vine branch constantly draws the sap from the living vine, so are we to cling to Jesus and receive from him by faith the strength and perfection of his own character. So here we see the reason why did Jesus want us to connect with him and to be a branch in the true vine. Just like in the natural world, uh, probably most of you haven't had much to do with uh, you know, connecting different things together. But almost every apple tree that you can buy, they have discovered that certain roots will be the best to use, but not the whole apple tree. So they take another tree that they want that will produce the kind of apples that it should, and they graft that in to the rootstock. And this brings about uh, the kind of apples that we love so much. Well, that's the same uh, type of activity that Jesus is talking about here. We, by ourselves, would make shipwreck of our life. But he has a plan whereby we can be grafted in to the true vine and produce that which he produces, which, as it puts it here, two things. We can have the strength of Jesus. I was thinking about what we heard this morning. You know, there's getting to be more and more people that don't have a good beginning in life. They, they start out with abuse, they start out with lack of love, they start out with all these kind of things. But aren't you thankful that Jesus has a solution to all that? Amen. He says you can be grafted into the true vine and you will now have my strength and you will now have my character. And so the longer we stay uh, in, the more strength we have and the more perfection we have from him because we're grafted in. Now this describes the beginning of this vine that he was talking about. This comes from a Review and Herald article of November 2, 1897. On the hills of Palestine, our Heavenly Father planted a goodly vine. Can you see it's talking about Jesus? The Heavenly Father planted a vine. 
by the name of Jesus in the hills of Palestine. And he himself was the husbandman. It had no remarkable form that would at first sight give an impression of its value. So when you walk by and you see this vine, you, you're not uh, motivated particularly that there's something great there. <coughs> it appeared to come up as a root out of a dry ground and attracted but little attention. We learn that from Isaiah 53 verses 2 and 3, which is a prediction of how Jesus would be accepted when he came to earth. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Now, it's not talking about beauty of character because that's really what attracted people to him. He couldn't hide the beauty of his character. But those that were not looking for character and they were simply looking at the external, they didn't see anything in the external uh, part of Jesus to let them know this is a very special vine. You need to connect with him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Now you would think that the Jews would not make the mistake of rejecting Jesus based on this chapter. But due to their connection to the satanic vine, they had developed the idea that this chapter was so dangerous that they warned everybody not to study that chapter. They, they said, you, you, will, uh, you, know, you will suffer, even from us, you will suffer if you study that chapter. So that left them unprepared, as well as not recognizing the meaning of the sanctuary systems that when Jesus came to do the very thing that this describes. And so even though God planted this vine there in Palestine that was intended to be a blessing to every Jewish person and all the rest that would connect with that vine, it didn't really happen for most people because they didn't see anything really great in him. Going back to the same reference, it says, But when attention was called to the plant, it was by some declared to be of heavenly origin. So there were a few people, and the disciples were among them, that they recognized Jesus was the Messiah. I don't know that they understood the divine principle at the beginning but they understood that he was the Messiah. And so uh, they, they saw that beauty, but when they received the idea that it would stand more gracefully and attract more attention than themselves, they wrestled to uproot the precious plant and cast it over the wall. Well, that sounds like Nazareth, doesn't it? That at first they said, wow, what an amazing uh, a message he's giving here. But then they turned on him and they wanted to push him over the cliff. It also happened with the Jewish leaders that they couldn't help but see some of the beauty, but they really didn't want to uh, be grafted in. And sad to say, it even happened with Judas. Ultimately, he saw a lot of beauty, but eventually it 
did just like it said here, that would attract more attention than themselves, and so they chose to get rid of the plant instead. Men of Jerusalem took the plant and bruised it and trampled it under their unholy feet. Their thought was to destroy it forever, but the heavenly husbandman never lost sight of his plant. So Jesus was cared for by his father, whether it looked like he was doing it or whether he wasn't, he was caring for him and he never allowed the destruction to actually occur. It looked like it sometimes, but not, he didn't allow it to happen. After men thought that they had killed it, he took it and replanted it on the other side of the wall. He hid it from the view of men. In other words, the true vine was planted in heaven on the other side of the wall. And the, the imagery there is that, you know, when something is planted on the other side of the wall, it can still send its benefit over the wall to help human beings in this world. And that's what has been done. He hid it from the view of men, but so they can't damage it anymore. But the benefit of being grafted in is still available. We can praise God for that. Then the next verse says, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Now, <clears throat> some of the men were disturbed about that. In fact, they asked me a question. It's the first time a doctrinal question has been asked me in front of the whole group. But they said, uh, is it true that once saved, always saved? Well, I think the question was sparked by this phrase. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. What do you mean? Somebody is a Christian and they don't make it? It bothered them. And so I gave them the answer. Uh, they kind of did some thinking about that. They didn't say they accepted it or they didn't. But they did do some thinking about that. Now, as you think about what Jesus was really saying, would Jesus ever let a Christian down? No. no. So the only re way that somebody can become a dead branch and have to be pruned off, you know, in my trees, I have to cut off some dead branches. They, they weren't dead before, but Something happened and uh, the sap started, stopped flowing and so it got dead. So the whole responsibility to be a dead branch is up to us. We're the ones that do it. But he tells us that if we become a dead branch, he has to cut us off. He can't allow dead branches to be a part of the vine. But then there's the more encouraging part. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, or he prunes it, that it may bring forth more fruit. If you just allow trees and uh, vines and so on to just grow how they want to grow, they produce less fruit, they produce smaller fruit. And so someone that properly cares for their trees, which I don't, but if you properly care for them, you increase the production by cutting off various parts of it. That means that when we are joined to Christ, we're not perfect yet. There are things in our characters that have to be cut off, but he has promised that his father, who's the husbandman, 
we'll cut those off. We have a choice though. If we don't want it cut off, then what will end up happening eventually is we'll become a dead branch. But uh, if we allow him to cut it off, then we will produce, as it says here, that it may bring forth more fruit. So there's the process. We have to be connected to Christ. We have to be willing for the pruning process. We have to be willing to keep hanging on to Jesus because if we don't, we'll become a dead branch. Here's a thought from a manuscript in 1898. The branches are not tied to the vine by any mechanical process or artificial fastening. Now that's the way they do it in the beginning when they graft trees. They have to you know, tie something around it real tightly to, to make sure that this is going to connect. But that's not the way God does it. They are united to the vine and have become part of it. That's part of his creative work. He can just speak and we're grafted in. Doesn't have to go a period of time. We're grafted in right away by his creative power. They are united to the vine and have become part of it. They are nourished by the roots of the vine. So, those who receive Christ by faith become one with him in principle and action. Now, from my study, there's two aspects uh, to this uh, situation of, you know, being connected to the vine. There's a big act at the beginning, and then there's continued acts after that. The one at the beginning turns us around. That's why we call it conversion. You're chasing the world. You, you like the things of the world. You're moving in that direction. Those are the things that make you happy. But then when you wake up, that that's not satisfying, and you turn the other way to follow Jesus, that's the big change. And all your basic desires are all changed at that moment. And so now what makes you happy is following Jesus. But as you walk the Christian life, there are times that you find yourself doing things you ought not to do, or maybe you read something that you find out you shouldn't be doing, and now there has to be another action on God's part. He has to cut off that branch, and we have to let him do it. Otherwise, he can't cut it off. It's a voluntary thing. And so as we receive his pruning work, we continue to grow and, and become more and more like him. So those who receive Christ by faith become one with him in principle and action. But it takes both of those activities for that to be fully true. In other words, every time you give up something that he tells you you should, you get more united to him. They are united to him and the way they live is the life of the Son of God. So the sap that comes into the branch is the sap from Jesus. We don't have any sap in us, at least not as the originator of it. It has to come from the root into the vine and then into the branch. They derive their life from him who is life. That's why legalism doesn't really work. Because if a person is trying to be a Christian by the legalistic method, and you know, Adventists get accused of being legalists 
But really, there's more legalists in the Protestant and Catholic world than there are in the Adventist world. Because there's really only two ways to try to live the Christian life. Either you are a branch connected to the true vine, or you're a legalist. That's the only two oppor opportunities there are. And so it's kind of like, you know, when you point your finger, there's three fingers pointing back at you, and they point at Adventists. As legalists, they're pointing at themselves, yeah, we're legalists too, but they don't admit it. So here as we look at a person, here, here's the kind of person that really gets looked at as a legalist. If they are eager to follow all the instructions of Jesus, they want to please him in doing everything he asks, then most people are going to say, oh, you're a legalist. But that's not really the issue. The issue is which vine are we grafted into? And if we're into the true vine and receiving the sap, the reason we want to do that is because he is putting it in us. We're getting that from him. <laughs> and, and, you know, nobody's going to call Jesus a legalist, will they? But we are getting it from him. Now that reminded me of a text in the Old Testament, Isaiah 5, verses 1 and 2. Now I will sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. This is the same vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. So that hill was Palestine. Now Jesus hadn't come yet, but it is telling this as though he had come, a very fruitful hill, and he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine. Jesus is the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it, and also made a wine press therein, and he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. What happened? Well, the branches, generally speaking, there were true people of God. There has been ever since Adam all the way uh, down. But in general, the Israelite nation and later the Jewish nation, they grafted into Satan's vine. And so it goes on to talk more about this, but unfortunately, even though God wanted to have a vine that would bear a lot of fruit because they were all connected with Jesus, actually the truth was there was almost no fruit and the fruit was bitter, and it didn't taste good because it came from the wrong source. So he doesn't want that to happen again to the uh, followers of Jesus, the disciples and those who would listen to them. He didn't want that to happen again. So he tried to help us understand. Baptism may be repeated over and over again. So a person gets baptized, later they think, well, I got too much wrong with me, I need to be baptized again. And later they feel, well, I got to be baptized again. But of itself, it has no power to change the human heart. Don't put your trust in your baptism. Your baptism is a testimony to the world that you think you've been grafted into Jesus. Now your life is going to demonstrate whether you did get grafted in or not. But it's your testimony to the world that I've been grafted in. Well, how does the graft work? The heart must be united with Christ's heart. The will must be submerged 
in his will. The mind must become one with his mind. The thoughts must be brought into captivity to him. So let's look at that. That's a very important series of statements. If we're grafted in, then these things will happen in our life. First one, our heart is united with his heart. In other words, his love of souls, his love of people, his desire to help everyone get ready for his coming, that's going to become our desire. And anything we can do to help that to happen, that's, that's going to be our desire, as well as for us to be there you know, with him. The next one, the will must be submerged in his will. <clears throat> Just because we've been grafted in doesn't mean that there aren't things that our will would like to do that aren't good. And so when we come up against one of those things, if we're grafted in, we're going to say, okay, Lord, not my will, but yours. I, I would like to do this, but... I'm not going to do that because I don't want to lose the sap that's coming into my life. I want to keep that. And I want to keep that uh, beneficial sap flowing into my life. The next one it mentions is the mind must become one with his mind. In other words, what he wants to be done you know, what I always uh, think of when I think of this is that there were a lot more missionaries that God wanted to call from the United States. But the prospective missionary said, I'm not willing to leave my family and go to a foreign land where I won't see them maybe ever or hardly ever. In the early days, they didn't have furloughs. They, they went for their lifetime to the mission field left their children, their parents, or whatever, and they went there. But, you know, today it's hard to find people, even with furloughs, to be missionaries, which shows the difficulty that so many have with the will of God. But the issue is, what does God want? If you say, I want what I want, you may not have disconnected yet, but you're starting to interfere with the flow of the sap. And eventually, if you keep doing that, you're not going to have the sap anymore. So we have to be willing. And sometimes he asks us to do things that are very hard to bear. I remember uh, when we first felt the call to come to Wildwood. None of our friends where we worked and, and worshipped thought it was a good idea. My parents didn't think it was a good idea. In their mind, you know, they wanted me to become a well-known Adventist and, you know, get a church somewhere that would be a successful church. And here I was going to a place nobody knows about down in the hills of Georgia. But it was plain that God's will was telling us to go. And praise the Lord, we made the right decision. We went. You know, as I look back over my life, I think I'm better known in the world by coming to Wildwood than I would have been if I'd stayed in the regular uh, situation. I mean, there's people all over the world that know about me. And when I got COVID, I found out there's a lot of people all over the world praying, you know, that I'll get well. So uh, doing God's will may look like in the beginning it's going to be uh, an unfortunate thing for you. You're going to miss out on something you'd like and so on. Another one that I think I've mentioned before, but <clears throat> to come to Wildwood meant giving up the ministry, which was the only job I ever wanted to do from my earliest childhood. 
because I knew going to Wildwood, well, in the beginning I thought I'm going to go on to Andrews, you know, so I, I wasn't so worried in the beginning about giving up the ministry. But when the Lord said, I don't want you to go to Andrews, I want you to stay at Wildwood, then came the decision, oh, my whole life, the only thing I wanted to do is be a pastor, and now I won't be a pastor. But you know, it was interesting. After a few years, he uh, gave me a license to be a pastor, and later he gave me uh, ordination to be a pastor. I, I had totally given that up. So you don't always give up things forever when you follow the Lord's will, but you will give up some things forever and hopefully learn they weren't good anyway. And it's better you didn't do it. Then it says, the thoughts must be brought into captivity to him. So we have, we, by connecting to the vine, we can get to the place where any thought that we know doesn't belong in connection with Jesus, we won't accept that thought. We just turn that thought away and only think about what we know he would want us to think about. Wow, isn't that a big enough benefit to be connected to the vine? <laughs> what could you think of that's any better than that? That reminded me of the text that Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. So on the front end it looks like crucifixion, but on the other end you have life. <laughs> Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. <laughs> I can't take any credit because what I'm doing, what I'm saying, what I'm thinking, it all came from Christ. And the life I live by the faith, by my faith? No. I live by the faith of the Son of God. So apparently in this sap that flows into us, we are actually uh, benefiting from the faith of Jesus who loved me and gave himself for me. Should be easy to give ourselves for connection with him because he, was, he loved us enough to be willing to die for us. Here's some more results of abiding. The regenerated man has a vital union with Christ. As the branch derives its sustenance from the parent stock, and because of this, bears much fruit, not just fruit, but much fruit. So, the true believer is united with Christ and reveals in his life the fruits of the Spirit. We're all familiar with those. We'll read them in a minute. But the fruit that we bear is fruit that everyone enjoys, including ourselves. The branch becomes one with the vine. Storm cannot carry it away. We've had a few windy uh, times lately. It blows things all around in my house. But <clears throat> it says storm cannot carry it away. Frost cannot destroy its vital properties. Had a little struggle with frost on our strawberries this year. <coughs> Nothing is able to separate it from the vine, Amen. except you. <laughs> you can separate from the vine. But there's nothing else. Jesus protects us against all the storms, against all the freezing weather. He protects us from that. It is a living branch, and it bears the fruit of the vine. So, with the believer, by good words and good actions, he reveals the character of Christ. Verse 3. Now this one 
at first puzzled me a little bit because it seems to be a different idea than the rest of the verses around it. It says, Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. I'm going to suggest to you that the sap is represented in this parable by the Word of God, the Bible, the inspired writings. They are the Word of God. And it's that sap that comes from Jesus. He's the originator of all the Word. And uh, that is what makes us clean through the ministry of the Word. In Ephesians 5, 25 and 6, it says, Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. So here it's pictured as, as cleaning us with water, but it identifies that the water is the word. Now most of sap is water, there are nutrients in it as well. But here we see, I believe, uh, his method of cleansing us. If there's anything in God's word we don't want to do, it hinders the cleansing. But each time we read or we hear and we follow by his power, now we are getting cleansed until eventually everything uh, is cleansed. Here's one from a manuscript, 1902. It is through obedience to the word that Christ's disciples are made clean. Amen. So, to the extent we're not doing what the word tells us to do, we are unclean. And this is a process. We don't, we don't just get clean at our conversion. Many things go, you know, but there's more that has to get cleaned up. So we have to keep studying the Word and allowing the Word to point out what needs pruned off and to let, let the husbandman prune it off. And we, we keep getting then more and more uh, like Jesus. And another one says the same thing from the Review and Herald article. In receiving and obeying His Word, the disciples were cleansed and purified. Mm -hmm. Now they had had a lot of cleansing by the time Jesus gave this parable. And so he was uh, not only telling them, you're clean through the word, but he means I have to keep on cleaning you uh, through the word as well. Then verse 4, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye, abide in me. This points out the, the waste of time in trying to bear fruit if he is not the one we are grafted into. Because only when we are grafted into him can we bear fruit? Otherwise, we're going to bear the characteristics of the enemy instead of the ones that we want to have. Desire of Ages 676, abiding in Christ means, and this is very important, a constant receiving of his spirit. Now, here's the part that has to develop. <clears throat> Theoretically, it doesn't have to, but in practice, it has to. We, we could, from our very conversion experience, always, constantly receive the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. But we don't. We have a tendency to get attracted away from that. And so our life is made up of the benefits of being connected to the Spirit, and then for an instant or for a few minutes or even a few days, God forbid, we, we get separated from the Spirit. 
And that's when the bad things appear. But it means, abiding in Christ means <clears throat> a constant receiving of his spirit. Also it means a life of unreserved surrender to his service. So the moment we complain about you know, not wanting to surrender to his way, we're in danger at that point. The channel of communication must be open continually between man and his God. So that is our marching orders. We must learn how to every second of every day be receiving the Spirit because that's when we'll have much fruit. <coughs> Abide in me. This means continual faith on the part of the believer. Abide in me. This means listen to the instruction of Christ. We must do his will. So there's another part. Constantly receiving the Spirit. Constantly exercising faith. And constantly following even if it's new, what God said that we should do. That's what it means to abide in him. And in closing, we'll take a brief look at the fruit. Wouldn't you like to be this kind of person? Galatians 5, 22 and 3. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. Want to be happy all the time? Peace. I'm going to be peaceful all the time. Long suffering. I'm going to be willing to put up with what others do to you and be long suffering about it. Gentleness. You want to be somebody that's hurting people all the time or would you like to be gentle? Goodness. That one's. The, one of the basic ones, I guess. Faith. You like to be meek. If you didn't hear the sermon a couple of weeks ago on meekness, that's worth listening to. And temperance, which really, in a way, is the foundation of all of these things. If those look attractive to you, then what you have to do is stay connected to the vine. And you will have, not the fullness of it immediately, but you will have more and more of those fruits in your life. In John 15, 16, Jesus said this, that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. In other words, you don't get it and then lose it that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. So the closer we are abiding in Christ, we get to the place where we only ask for the right things and our prayers always get answered. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. Whatever we ask for, it gets uh it's given to us. There are still some things, you know, that he hasn't promised. And you have to ask, thy will be done. You don't know for sure whether he'll do it or not. Because you don't, he doesn't tell us whether he would do it or not. But all the things that he said he would do for us, we can ask for that. And he will uh, give it to us. <clears throat>